Welcome everybody to this week's Cognitive Psychology Lecture and our topic will be short-term memory and we are starting with an introduction into that topic. Okay, so let's let's have a look. Now when we talk about memory um, it's important to recognize first that memory consists of several stores not just of one store and most know the sh or have heard of short-term memory and long-term memory, but they are also sensory stores. And we briefly mentioned them already in the attention lecture, and I don't want to go into too much detail today as well. These hold information very, very briefly, just for a couple of hundred milliseconds. So it's in the visual domain, it's called the iconic store, and in the auditory domain, it's called the echoic store, and or visual and auditory buffer, you may also say. And this is just the, the very first store where uh, when the information comes in, it's kind of a buffer store to keep it so that following up stores and attention can work on that, can read out that information. And it's just a couple of hundred milliseconds. It's a little bit like when you see something or hear something, the, the echo you have in your mind after that. And they're specific for each sensory modality. And uh, as I said, with the iconic and echoic buffer. Then we have the short-term memory store, which is the topic for today. And this store holds information in the order of seconds, some would say up to minutes, and it has a limited capacity. We'll look into the details of that today. And then finally we have the long-term memory, and this holds information about very long periods of time, and uh, it is assumed to have an... sorry, just move something here. Um, and it is assumed to have an unlimited capacity in principle. And the topic of long-term memory we will look at in the next week. Okay, so short-term memory. And there are other terms for that around, synonyms. So it's also called sometimes primary memory or active memory or immediate memory. Some people also call it working memory, but as you will see later, um, I would say that nowadays there's a slightly different meaning to working memory as compared to short-term memory. Short working memory also contains working memory also contains short-term memory, but has additional elements to it. And the definition for short-term memory um, would be that short-term memory is the capacity for holding a small amount of information in mind in an active, readily available state for a short period of time. So this definition already incorporates some of the things we, we said. So it's a limited amount of information which can be kept in short-term memory. It has... we, we can store it for a short period of time, limited period of time. And another thing is that it's in an active, readily available state. That means that we have direct access to it, we are conscious of its content, and we can use it, for instance, for mental arithmetics, to do stuff with the information, to work with the information. Okay, so um, there's a lot of research into short-term memory. And when we want to investigate short-term memory, then most people use a very prototypical task, a short-term memory task. And I would like to demonstrate the different stages of such a short-term memory task, because these stages also link to the mental functions of our short-term memory system. So let's have a look. Usually in a short-term memory task, where you would present the items, the stimuli, participants are supposed to remember. So, for instance, when we want them to learn a word list, we would present the words. And this links to the first stage of, of the cognitive memory system, and it is, this is that the information has to be encoded into short-term memory. And when we present items, we can do that in a many different ways. So for instance we can just give the participant a sheet of paper with all items on them so that they can do this all, they can manage their time by themselves, how long they look at each item and things like that. Or in particular now with computerized presentations we can present one by one and do it that way. 
we can manipulate how long we show the items. We can give people a sheet of paper for 15 seconds or a minute. When we present items on the screen, we can do that for half a second or for three seconds each. And we can have an interval between items when we do that individually. One second an item, one or two seconds break, then a next item. And these parameters all affect how good our memory performance is. So it's important to keep them in mind that when you think about, okay, I present information to participants and want to test how much they can retain or remember, think about all these factors. Um, also in real day life, uh, when you um, design something where you want to present to students or, or something else, that this is important, or an information, a notification for people. Then we have the retention interval. That is the, in our memory system, the storage component. So here the item presentation is encoding. I have external information. I have to process that to encode it into memory. Now I have to store it and keep it alive in memory. I have to maintain the information. And the parameters for this stage are, first of all, the duration. How long do I have to store? And there are some short-term memory tasks where this explicit retention interval is kept to a zero length. So you present something and you ask for an immediately re immediate recall. Um, but you can also say, okay, try to remember that for 30 seconds. And the next question and the next two points are related is rehearsal allowed. Or, and, and if not, do we pre prevent rehearsal? What does rehearsal mean? Suppose I tell you, please remember a phone number, uh, 1578. Just a stupid example. And then I tell you for 30 seconds. Then you probably do something like 1578, 1578 in your mind. That's rehearsal. And we will see later which structures are used for that. And do you allow that rehearsal or not. If you don't allow it, the typical approach to do that is that participants get an additional task during the retention interval. So I present you the phone number and then I tell you, please count backwards from 100 in steps of three. So participants, as soon as they heard the last number, would have to say, start saying out loud, 197, 90, Four, ninety-one, eighty-eight, and so forth. And this task is quite challenging. So, uh, and you can use different variations. So that um, just this occupies your system, and you can't do the rehearsal. Another option is to just repeatedly say, which is easier to say a word. For instance, the 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 the, because it occupies your your verbal system, so that you can't. Um, rehearse the numbers anymore. So that's the storage element of memory, which we can test or text with the retention interval. And then we have the test phase. And this is the retrieval of information from the storage. So this is a third phase and the third part of our memory system. And first of all, we can ask, um, do we use recall or recognition? So what's the difference between the two? Recall, or often also called free recall, means that uh, in the example of word list, you just give participants a blank sheet of paper and a pen, and they should write down the words which you presented before. So you don't have any help or cue, and this is usually the most difficult vari variant of, of this retrieval of information. The other one is recognition. And recognition usually works, let's say you had to learn 10 words, and then in the test phase you are given 20 words, the 10 words you have learned, and 10 new words you haven't learned. And for each word you have to say, yes, it was in the list I have learned before, or no, it wasn't in the list I have learned before. And this usually results in a little bit of better performance in the participants, because um, you get this this cue, you say the word, so recognizing something is easier than recalling. Another thing you can vary is, suppose you present 10 words, 
and you can request that they are recalled in the exact order you presented them or you can say well write it down in any order you wish and of course in serial order is more difficult this is more linked than to working memory usually because it requires you to also retrieve the sequential information of the words is there a time limit how much time do participants have to, to uh, retrieve the information? And as measures, we can take the accuracy, which is probably the most common one. So how many percentage of the words, how many percent did they recall correctly? Or in particular, if we do recognition task at a computer where they have to say yes, no, yes, no to each word, we can also take the response times. OK, so just to recap that, um, just to recap that, we have three phases in a memory task which nicely link to the three components of memory system or three functions of memory system so that we have to encode, we have to store and then we have to retrieve to get it out of memory again. Okay, so let's have a little demonstration. And um, for this and for the other parts as well in the free, in, in the short term memory um, session, it's, it's a good idea to have a sheet of paper and a pen or something like that because we do some demonstrations. And um, here we don't, I don't have to wait too long because you can just simply pause the video if you need to get something. Okay, so please get a sheet of paper and a pen. And I will present 12 words for you. Uh, each one for two seconds and your task is to memorize the words as good as you can without writing them down of course that would be cheating we want to test your short-term memory and when the instruction appears on the screen then please write down all words when you remember it and you can use any order uh, it doesn't need to be in the order of presentation okay so please get ready and three two, one, and go. Okay, now immediately please write down all the words you can remember and please pause the video um, to take your time to write it down because for those who didn't do the exercise I will just continue now with the video. Okay, so if you did that, so you can have a look at how many words you remembered. These were the words in the order of their presentation. And again, you can quickly pause the video to see um, which ones you remembered and which ones you didn't remember. Now, one thing to note is I used to do that as a, as a poll in, in the lecture, um, which of course now doesn't work. And if you do that and then people say, how many people did remember fashion? How many people did remember indoors and so forth? Then we notice something and that is that often on you know on average um, the earlier items are remembered better and also the later items are remembered better while those in the middle are more difficult to remember and this is called the serial position effect and results in such a u-shaped curve so this graph shows on the x-axis the position of the word in the sequence. So this is word 1, word 2, word 3 and how far up you go. So the first words and the last words and the middle words. And the y-axis shows you how many words have been recalled in percentage. So 50% means half of the words are recalled. And this is just an example to illustrate the effect which was first discovered by Hermann Ebbinghaus. 
And this serial position curve indicates that the first words are remembered better and the last words. And this is called the primacy effect and the recency effect. Okay, well we keep that in mind for a moment. The primacy effect means um, that the first words are on average remembered better and a reason for this could be that the early words can be rehearsed more often. So you know the first word, I can't remember the first one which, was, which it was, uh, let's just say it was fashion, then you see the word, you can st start with fashion, 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 and then the next word comes up, which might be coat. Then you do fashion, coat, fashion, coat, fashion, coat. So the later the words, the less you can do rehearsal. And along the same lines, it, for the first word, where you don't have to rehearse anything yet so far, um, you can do a deeper processing. So for the first words you can fashion and let's say the second was code, you can start, oh fashion and code they are related so maybe I can somehow link them for each other. So there are arguments which say that the first words may actually already have been transferred and encoded into long-term memory so that later when we do have to recall the words they come from long-term memory and not from short-term memory anymore. The recency effect is that the last words are just still, still fresh in memory they're still highly active. And the recency effect can be strongly reduced or even completely abolished if you introduce a retention interval. That means the last word stops and you don't have to immediately recall, but you have to wait for, let's say, 10 or 15 seconds. And participants have to do a task during that so that they can't rehearse, like this counting backwards. And then you see that the curve goes down and just is flat towards it the end. Okay, so to summarize our introduction, we have seen that short-term memory is a capacity store which is limited for keeping information active for a short time. And the typical short-term memory task has three stages, the item presentation, then the retention interval where we have to keep it, maintain the information, and then the recall. So the memory systems have at least three functions which relate to these stages and this is the encoding of information, the storage maintenance of information and the retrieval of the information. So and in a free recall task as we just have seen where we have immediate recall a u-shaped serial position curve is observed. And this is explained by the primacy effect and the recency effect, as you have just seen. Okay, if you have any questions, please uh, just post them in the BBL forums for that. Okay, thanks a lot for watching, and I hope to see you soon for the next part.